Thank you, Nicholas. So we, this is the last panel of the day, and uh, it's, it's, I know it's keeping you from your chilled beer, but uh, I'm, I'm sure with the power-packed uh, panel that we have, it, it should be very interesting. I think I was, I was looking at the numbers, and between them, the, the, the gentleman on my, on my left control about 400 ships, so it's very significant. They really do have a pulse on the dry bulk market as well as on the MPP and uh, heavy lift sectors. So for this introduction, so immediately to my left, there's Kyriakis uh, Paniidis, who is a managing director of uh, Singapore-based AAL Shipping, uh, which owns and operates a fleet in the MPP and heavy lift segment. Uh, then there's uh, Reginald Sequera, who is dry bulk head of uh, Great Eastern Shipping, which is uh, Mumbai-based and which has exposure to various sectors, but in the dry bulk space, they've got exposure to Camser Max, Supermax, and also they own one Cape size vessel. And further to the left is Martin Wade, who is uh, CEO of uh, Singapore-based Green Road Shipping, although the parent is out of South Africa, which mainly operates in the handy size and Supermax segments. And then there's Mats Berglund, who is CEO of uh, Pacific Basin, which Hong Kong-based operates in the handy size and, and Supermax segment as well. And finally, there's Khaled Hashim, who is managing director of Bangkok-based Precious Shipping, which operates in the handy size Supermax and, and Ultramax segment. So to, ta to start with, perhaps I could just ask each of the panelists to just give a very brief introduction about uh, each of their companies, starting with Kyriakis. Yeah. Hi. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, AAL Shipping came into existence in 1995, 23 years back, as a regional liner operator in the multi-purpose breakback um, uh, industry, connecting the major ports of Asia with Australia. In the recent years, we have, uh, we have expanded. We have expanded our footprint into the global uh, arena by building ships and by investing in infrastructure and in the company and then uh, became within a short period of time a leading uh, breakback operator in the global markets. Great Eastern Shipping has been there for about seven decades, successfully operating. Our skill has been dynamically managing the market cycles. We are not particularly invested in one sector, but trying to see where is the highest value. We technically and commercially in-house managed, believe in building a strong balance sheet, and continue to serve with long-term equations and relationship with uh, our charters and financiers, as also with all the stakeholders who have got long-termism in the business. Thank you. Greenrod Shipping is, as Gautam said, Singapore-based company trading under two brands, Island View Shipping, IVS, which was formed 40 years ago, and Unicorn Tankers, uh, over 50 years now. Uh, IVS is uh, in the handy and Supermax, Ultramax space, with particular emphasis on, on Japanese built. Uh, Unicorn Tankers is in the MR space, uh, both MRs and handies, with emphasis on, on Korean built. And what I can add is that, as Gautam said, we're actually owned out of South Africa, but the decision was made uh, 18 months ago that, uh, to, to list shipping, to spin us off. And on the 22nd of uh, June, we will be listed on the NASDAQ in New York. So a whole new chapter for us begins and, and very exciting times. Thank you, Martin. Uh, Mats Berglund with Pacific Basin. We are a handy size in Supermax owner-operator. We operate typically about 240 ships, of which 150 uh, are handy size and 90 Supramax. Of those, we own now 106, and the rest we charter in. So we're an operator. We're not a tonnage provider. Uh, about $1.2 billion market cap listed in Hong Kong. Khalid. Thanks, Matt. Uh Precious Shipping uh, was born in 1987, uh, came of age in 1993 uh, by getting listed on the Thai stock market. Uh, currently, we own 36 ships uh, spread between the handy size up to the ultramax sector. Thank you, Khalid. Uh, perhaps I can start uh, 
with you, Khalid. My first question is, um, so the, the CEO of a, uh, a well-known Greek-owned U.S.-listed shipping company was quoted in trade winds last week as saying that the, the order book in the dry bulk sector is quite scary. Some of you may have seen this one. Uh, suggesting, of course, that uh, the orders that have taken place in the last particularly eight to ten months uh, will likely lead to oversupply issues again. Um, could you comment on, on how you see the dry bulk market evolving and are you, are you concerned about the, the order book and how do you see rates evolving? Okay, so I'm going to answer this in, in two parts. Uh, the first part is basically looking at the gap between demand and supply. Uh, if you look at that in 2017, uh, supply grew by 2.93% in the dry bulk sector. And at the same time, if you look at the Clarkson's uh, uh, database for uh, ton mile uh, demand increase in percentage terms, it was 5.1%. So roughly a gap of about 2% uh, percent between demand and supply. And we went from near death at the beginning of the year to profitability by the end of the year. If you look at the same statistics for 2018, Clarkson's began the year by saying that demand is going to grow by about 3.5%, but at the Marine Money Conference uh, on the 12th of April uh, this year, uh, Martin Rowe corrected me when I gave that number and said, now we look at it as if it's going to grow by 3.8%. And if you look at anybody uh, giving you any form of statistics on the supply side, you will see that supply will grow by less than 2%. So again, a huge gap uh, between demand and supply, and therefore I would say quite clearly, just based on what happened in 17 and what's likely to happen in 18 in terms of demand and supply uh, gap, uh, that we will have a very reasonable year. Now, that's one way of looking at it. The other way, of course, is to look at the forward order book. If you look at the forward order book, the last time that we have seen this type of a small order book, you've seen that the BDI has jumped that's about three or four times in, in, the, in the last uh, 15 or 18 years or 20 years, uh, you would find that the BDI has jumped up significantly in the following two or three years. So I would be, uh, just looking at the statistics, I would say that yes, 18 and 19 look like good years. Okay, thank you, Khalid. So Matt, uh, the FFA market, if you, if you look at that particular market as a forward indicator, it doesn't seem to suggest as much optimism. W what is your view? How do you see the market? Well, I, I agree with uh, Khalid. Uh, the fundamentals look positive, and, and a big part of that is the supply side. But I am worried about the order book, and I agree with the previous panel. You need a new building like you need a hole in, in our head, right? Uh, that the order book is very different for the different segments. Uh, the Cape Size and Up order book, and also uh, Kamsar Maxis, as this article you referred to, that order book is, is worryingly big. And I cannot understand how you can order a ship today for delivery two, three years from now with an HFO engine. These engines are optimized and designed to burn heavy fuel oil. So I cannot understand that, especially not when second-hand prices are so much cheaper than, than new buildings. So please stay away from new buildings. But for Handy Size and Supermax, we have an order book of about 5%. and hasn't been this low since 1999. Agreed. And logically, it should remain like that because of the unprecedented uncertainty on technology, new regulation, fuel, etc. And how are we going to get the CO2 levels down this much uh, by continuing to, to run uh, HFO engines, right? It has to change. And hence, people are, are waiting to order. Demand looks reasonable. So yes, we are we're positive on the, on the basic fundamentals. OK, thank you, Max. Uh, Reginald, you've got exposure to the Kamsar Max segment, which, as Matt suggested, there's been quite a few orders placed in, in that particular segment. Are, are you concerned, or are you still quite optimistic? I think, by and large, if you look at the order book, uh, it is declining. It's been a declining trend overall. But the order book, which has been placed in the last uh, one year or so, has, of course, caused some degree of concern. But if you look at the order book and analyze it a bit further, what you find is about 10 million dead weight of it was ordered before 2015, what you could call as the phantom order. That's about 13% of the fleet. Uh, as Matt mentioned, about over 58% is constituted by Cape. The remaining ones are the ones 
which is by the Handimax and the, the Supramax and the Kamsar Max, which are constituting that. The other point to note is also that about 22 million dead weight are the ships which are due for their fifth special survey between 2018 to 2020. So given that, and also the fact that these regulations are coming in, kicking in 2020, there is this, there is this, uh, this pressure on scrapping, which is probably going to come up in the next two, three years. So when you look at it, from purely from a supply point of view, it is looking more positive than it has been for over uh, eight years because there has been a burgeoning tonnage growth. But if you were to look at it from a demand point of view, it's not really rosy. There has been growth in different segments, whether it is on iron ore and coal, although they have been fluctuating. But net-net, I would say there is reason to be cautiously optimistic, but not really be euphoric and say there is going to be an extraordinary growth in the market. Okay, thank you, Reginald. So, uh, so moving on to, to Martin, do you think that, I think the market, everybody is, is extremely optimistic. Are we going to see rates like we saw in 2007, you expect, or are we just going to see a more of a gradual recovery? So far, we've seen a fairly gradual recovery. We've seen ship owners, I would say, move from making losses to finally breaking even. Where are we going to be in a year from now? I wish I knew. Um, it's an interesting one. Um, Obviously, the 2000s were exceptional, what happened with, with reduced yard capacity, genuine demand. The one thing about the market these days, it can go an awful lot higher, an awful lot lower than people think. So as to where the top of it is, it'll be higher than people think. What has been posited up to now, this has been a gradual increase. That we've moved up and then it came off, I think, that the level of the Cape market got to last month, a little over 7,000, shocked people. Maybe it sobered people up. So I, I think this is, this is a proper de market, demand is there. But when it goes up, it can go up as high as people want. As to, to whether it can go to 2007 levels, who knows? 2007 was never supposed to happen. But it will go higher than people think. And as usual with markets, as we see, when it crashes, it goes down lower than people think. Sure. Thanks, Martin. Uh, Kriakos, you are in a sector which is, to an extent, decoupled from, from dry bulk. Um, the Earnings for your sector, MPP and, and heavy lift, have been improving off late as well. There's more consolidation in your space. Uh, what's your outlook going forward? And what do you see as the driving factors for growth? Uh, I'll start from the supply, what the other gentleman said. Uh, Multipurpose, unlike the bulkier segment, has a very healthy, manageable supply front. Uh, when you look into, into our, the growth of the fleet, we will expect, as per your analyst in the drill, we do expect uh, a negative growth, which is a very, very pleasant uh, development to have after a decade of, of oversupply uh, threat we had in our sector. Uh, when you dig into, into the order book, you will see that the, there's only a few new builds coming up, and those, again, coming from uh, existing operators that they have a fleet that they need to recycle. So that, uh, that new, new builds that they're coming to the market, they will only be replacing older. Uh, tonnage which will go into into scrapping so multi-purpose is in a different uh, in a different uh, 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 shape like uh, bulkheads or tankers or containers so we have a, that that's a major driving force towards our optimists and towards our uh, uh, future uh, with regards to the earnings that you mentioned on the other hand uh, we have been uh, we have been struggling, and, and this is admittedly, we have been struggling by the bulk operators intruding into our, into our cargoes. Uh, being desperate, of course, over the last uh, years, they have been intruding into the MPP cargoes, into the steel, even into the project uh, cargoes. And uh, what we see lately over the last uh, uh, half a year is that, first of all, their pricing is becoming much higher, which helps, uh, uh, helps our margin to, to improve. And number two, we see them devoting back to their uh, traditional cargo commodities. And that, of course, uh, increase the market share that the multi purpose is getting from the dry, dry cargo. And that's, uh, that's brilliant news. And uh, although we had a very, very tough, difficult 10-year uh, uh, cycle, uh, the last uh, couple of years, we all say that we had uh, not only the perfect storm, we had been sailing into a tsunami waves. Uh, of course, uh, from, uh, from 
fish competition from both uh, barkers as well as containers, but uh, much more predominantly by uh, lack of project cargo into the oil and gas industry. Uh, now we have seen, uh, we have seen, and we get uh, feedback from customers, from majors, that uh, they are back into the drawing table. They are back into the budgetary process, which will bring the cargo, uh, as far as project cargo is concerned. <coughs> we will see that coming up from 2019 onwards. So in combination with the supply fund, in combination with the global economy uh, getting into an improved sh shape, and in combination with our intruders, uh, intruders uh, here uh, getting out of our way, then uh, we can only expect a much better, brighter future for multiple markets. Okay, thanks. Is, is your market also as dependent on, let's say, China is, as perhaps the dry bulk market is? Yes, demand, to, to a side. great extent, we are dependent by basically by the global uh, by the global uh, market. Uh, mm. You know, we're dealing with oil and gas, which is global. We're dealing with mining, which is, of course, Chinese. Is, 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 uh, Asia market is, is quite uh, dominant in that in that respect. Uh, we're dealing with infrastructure again. If you see the the, the, the geography is. is, is the Pacific uh, economy is, is much more reliable towards uh, more investments in, in, in infrastructure. We haven't seen any, any major investments, in, especially in the Euro area, but we start to see actually from this year, which is pleasing. Um, uh, we, we're saving the, the wind energy, which again, uh, it's a global uh, arena. Uh, it's, it's, it, it's looking promising. Okay, thank At you. Last, finally, eventually. Okay, thanks. If I can just borrow from the last panel, and if I can ask um, each of you, perhaps, if, if you were given $100 million later on this evening over drinks, uh, what would you be investing in? Would it be second-hand vessels? Would it be new buildings? Um, and what particular sectors? What is your area of interest uh, right now? So perhaps if you could start with uh, Khalid. $100 million. Wow. Uh, of course, uh, invest in uh, buying uh, second-hand ships, don't buy new buildings. Uh, that's uh, like Matt has said and uh, uh, the panel before Marco Fiori said, it's like uh, wanting a hole in your head. Uh, that's something that you don't really want. Uh, buy second-hand ships and I would buy it in the Ultramax space. Okay, thanks Matt. Try to draw the attention away from buying ships and, and buy into an existing company buy into a platform. Uh, it's been taking Pacific Basin 30 years to build up the cargo routes and the relationships and the contracts that we have. Offices in all the six continents and uh, you know, very efficient utilization, expertise, competence, how to load, how to, how to discharge 25 different types of commodities. In handy size in particular, it's not all about ships. It's a lot about the operation of the ships, and you can buy into, in the last optimistic period, 2013, people bought steel, right? But uh, they learned later that you, know, you need more than steel. You need to employ the ships. And today, many of these companies are forced to become operators because there's not, not enough time shorters around. So do not, you know, if you have to buy ships, you buy secondhand, uh, completely agree with with Khalid, but there's too little emphasis on all the other things you need to run a successful shipping business. You, you just don't need a ship. You need a lot of good people and, and a lot of expertise. Thanks, Matt. So I think that's a very good idea. So we track actually a number of uh, dry bulk listed companies around the world, and, and we see that actually many companies in your sector, for instance, are actually quite undervalued um, relative to the steel. So there's certainly an opportunity that's, yeah. How about you, Martin? Selective second-hand uh, dry cargo handers, supers, ultras, but having two hats, I'd, uh, I'd buy second-hand MR, modern tonnage. I think the tanker market's where we were in dry cargo probably 18 months ago. But all second-hand, yes, very much so. Okay, so no, no new buildings as yet? Okay, Reginald? Resales, but in, in theory we're tier two. The new buildings are supposed to be running out. It has to be tier three, in theory. Mm -hmm. Uh, first of all, I think we are not looking at the new building segment as all, uh, at all. One, because there is too much of ordering for such a long time. It's, it's virtually shooting yourself in the foot. 
So perhaps it's a time to be very restrained as far as new buildings go, particularly with all this uh, uncertainty and lack of clarity about uh, the regulations that are coming in. Uh, on the second hand space, we would uh, be, again be selective because it does provide even within a relatively firm market volatile phases, but we would go more on the handy maxes and supra maxes which are more fuel efficient and relatively more competitive on the quality parameters and pedigree. Okay, thank you. I think that's very promising that uh, no new buildings on this panel so far. Very good for the industry. Kriakos. Well, without a second thought. What's that? Second hand. Second hand. I will, okay. You said 100 million. Yep. I will spend 5 million campaigning to brainwash those that they have the intention to be new builds to change their mind. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and the rest I will, uh, I will say uh, acquisition of, of distressed companies together with distressed assets. Okay. Thank you. Uh, there's been a lot of talk in, in the press now about the potential trade war between the U.S. and China, and uh, this is something that could potentially impact the dry bulk uh, industry more than other sectors. Um, I'd, I'd love to hear your, your views. Uh, perhaps, maybe Reginald, perhaps you could start. I think the, the, the topic about uh, trade war and also this counter trade tariffs being imposed we feel it is more a distraction rather than destruction of demand. Because we have seen these uh, changes that are coming in either by regulation, suddenly announced by countries, sources of cargo drying out, but industry and trade has always found alternatives. And sometimes it is beneficial because longer haul tonnages, longer haul routes are found and cargoes are sourced. So yes, in the interim, it's going to be disruptive to the extent that there is lack of clarity and people are trying to hedge their bets. But eventually, as we are finding the cascading effects of uh, these tariffs uh, are going to impact other people who are unintended in this whole game. And therefore, I think better sense would prevail and trade will adjust itself. So this is a short to medium kind of a situation that we have to contend with. Okay, thanks. Matt, are you in the soya bean trade and do you, do you expect this will impact your business, its potential tariffs? Uh, we carried soybean, but not from the U.S. last year. But even if soybean is the commodity to take note of, the, the steel has minimal, if any, impact. Uh, China doesn't export any steel to, to, the, to, uh, to the U.S., uh, they don't export any wheat, hardly no corn, uh, not much sorghum, four or five million, but 32 million of, of soybean uh, went from U.S. to China 2017. Uh, but 54 million went from Brazil to China, and uh, China will obviously try to buy more. Number one, these tariffs are not implemented yet. They yep. are out for for uh, public uh, hearing and stuff. And the U.S. soybean season doesn't really start until October anyway, so there's plenty of time to hopefully uh, ag agree a solution on this. But even if they were to be implemented, this trade will obviously not completely go away. China will try to buy more from elsewhere. U.S. will try to sell their soybean to other countries. Uh, some, uh, some may stay there with the 25% tax because they, they do need uh, four times more protein in soybean than in, in alternative uh, feeds. So this is going to, to pig farms in, in China. But even if you take this whole trade, 32 million tons, it's only 0.6% of total seaborne trade. Uh, and, and a very small portion of it will, will go away, we think, if it's affected coal into China is 300 million tons and it varies quite significantly up and down and you know, this is not a big deal. Uh, it, has, it gets a lot more press than it, than it should get. Obviously the trend is not good but I think uh, Trump will have a lot of farmers outside the White House if he, he proceeds with this. This is hitting the states that voted for Trump uh, and, uh, and it's a much bigger deal for you as farmers than it is for, for dry bulk shipping. Sure. I think to the extent possible that the South Americans are able to increase production, um, I think that will actually be beneficial for uh, ton mile demand. Uh, they're not going to be able to make up the entire shortfall, perhaps from the U.S., but uh, if anything, it's positive. 
Uh, Kriakos, how do you see this affecting your, your business? Of course, it will have a, a negative harm. Huh? I mean, we are in shipping, we, we are depending on the global free trade, any sort of protectionist, any sort of uh, uh, trade wars, any sort of tariffs coming up, uh, it, it has a, a major impact. Uh, now, to what extent and to and how long would this last? Uh, this is the, I think, the we did experience, of course, uh, anti-dumping measures in Australia, in the US, on steels. We have experienced that. Uh, some of them came up in, in a short-term uh, measure. And, and, but at the end of the day, it will hit, eventually, it will hit the, the consumer. And, that, and consumers are already spoiled with cheap products. So the, the more protection you apply, the more uh, import taxes, duties you apply, then eventually it will come as a higher, more expensive product. And uh, that will have, of course, uh, that will have some sort of uh, resistance. And that will have some sort of reaction from, from the markets. And from, so I think and I'd like to believe that this will be a, uh, maybe a, shor a short term okay. situation that uh, maybe Trump wants to keep his promises, what he has been uh, telling the people when he was elected. So let him do that. And then let's find out uh, soon enough that that was not a wise decision to do so. Yeah. Okay, thanks. I think one of Trump's other favorite sectors is, is coal, and he's been trying to build up, increase uh, coal production in, in the U.S. Uh, on the other hand, we see countries like, like China uh, working hard to try and replace coal with uh, cleaner fuel like LNG for the energy needs. And then you've got India, uh, which is uh, trying to use more domestic coal in, instead of uh, imported coal. Um, how do you see this, uh, Reginald, how do you see this uh, moving, particularly, let's say, in a place like India? How do you see coal demand, import demand uh, going forward? Uh, in respect of India, coal will continue to be used. The relative balance between domestic versus import is the question. One thing we have seen is that after reaching a peak of 177 million ton import in 2014, the trend has been downwards towards import. Uh, which is made up by increased domestic uh, output. But having said that, even scaling up domestic output is not a continuous process because there are land rights that we have to deal with. There are also uh, union-related issues to be resolved, as also the question of uh, the productivity of the rail railway capacity that is made vis-a-vis -vis other products which are competing in a fast-growing economy. So given these, I would think that uh, the relative importance of imports will continue, uh, although the rate of growth of import will slow down. It will probably stabilize around the figures that we have seen in the last two years. It's about 150 million tons as far as, as, far as thermal coal, coal goes. Coming to coking coal, there has been an increase. Obviously, India is doing better as a steel producing country. Uh, and gradually now coming to being the second biggest producer in the world, maybe, uh, after China. So given that kind of status, the commodity on which we are really short is coking coal. There has been growth, but it is not uh, monumentally significant. We are only talking about 5 to 7 million tons of growth that has taken place. But if India does ramp up when China decides to slow down or reduce capacity, then there is a potential of maybe going up to 10 million tons. Net-net, so coal is not going to be a swing uh, producer or of demand, but it is going to be a balancer of demand. Because what we have seen is even within a year, China has swung between a net reduction in the first half and a significant increase in the second half. Because we cannot control weather, we cannot control alternative fuel pricing. Given these, I think uh, it is fair to assume that India will remain a stable importer, whereas China's role would depend upon alternative fuels as also domestic pricing. Okay, thank you. Um, I know that none of you really operate um, actively in the Cape size segment. However, it's a segment which does impact your markets as well. And Cape size, as we know, is driven uh, in a big way by what's happening in, in China, iron ore demand, the Chinese property market, the outlook for that market, the infrastructure outlook. Um, Khalid, do you have a view on what China's let's say, iron ore demand is going forward? Do you think we're going to reach peak iron ore in the next few years, or do you foresee this growth and urbanization trend in China to continue, 
let's say for the next 10 years i mean if you saw martin's uh, presentation this morning he ended with the one belt one road uh, map and i think uh, you must not forget that is going to be significantly steel intensive uh, in terms of its development and you're not talking about small change here you're talking about in trillions of dollars and spread over a period of at least 10 to 20 years uh, i don't see uh, china reducing imports per se so long as they are very uh, focused on pollution prevention because it's like uh, if you have blast furnace uh, steel production which is what china uh, mainly has then the quality of ore that you put in the quality of coke that you put in will determine the amount of pollution that you're going to create and the amount of steel that you're going to produce and as i said if they are focused on pollution prevention which they are uh, then i think imports of higher quality iron ore will continue to be there and uh, domestic iron ore will s keep uh, slowing down uh, so i think it's it's not that it's going to be a peak uh, iron ore uh, import that we have to really worry about we have to just see how china is going to progress in terms of the blast furnace uh, steel production uh, and in terms of balancing it with pollution okay thank you uh, this is an issue that uh, my next question is an issue that's been discussed uh, to quite a great extent uh, which is regarding the imo 2020 sulfur cap i think it would be interesting to hear from from perhaps very quickly each of you what your strategy is to deal with this new regulation are you are you intending to install scrubbers on your vessels or use low sulfur fuel just very quickly if you could start with uh, korea cuz AL's fleet is in the hands of the expert uh, Columbia Ship Management. They are still uh, reviewing this, and uh, there's still some time to, to take the call. Okay, thanks. Reginald? From our side, uh, we have taken a view that we will wait and watch, but not fit the scrubbers. Uh, and there is also this relative balance to be determined as far as how pricing goes. Secondly, scrubbers is also not a proven technology. It is being attempted. Uh, what will evolve as technologi uh, technological developments later on need to be seen. So rather than go and straight away fit it, uh, and secondly, as we said earlier, we are not really pursuing the new building route. So retrofitting our existing ships with scrubbers is not something which we are currently pursuing. Okay, thanks. Martin? Um, no, we're, we're not looking at the scrubber route. We, we're fortunate enough we have a very modern fleet. Uh, we're happy to burn low sulfur or gas oil. and. I think as an earlier panelist mentioned, I find it hard to believe that the major oil companies aren't going to come up with a solution. They're just going to sit there. I think it's already been mentioned by several of the CEOs that where they're going to keep on producing high sulfur with all the infrastructure and sell it for free. I find that somewhat hard to believe. So I suspect you, you might get a disconnect for, for one or two years, but uh, I think a, a, a solution will be found. And, and to be honest, I, I think there was a little bit of criticism maybe for the owner's head in the sand. It's not head in the sand. But I think it's just watch and wait and see. And this technology is potentially moving so quickly. And as, as a ship owner, I've never believed in being first off the blocks. It's better just to uh, just to follow in some ways. Thanks. Yeah, I I hope Martin is right. And certainly the the, the smaller ship sizes that we have, uh, it's more more difficult to make the the numbers work. Uh, and. Uh, I mean, it's a very frustrating development. Uh, it would have been so much better if heavy fuel would have been banned and we would have had a level playing field and we would clearly have had the, the bad stuff taken out of the oil uh, responsibly by the refineries. We would have received uh, slower speeds which have reduced emissions. Uh, you know, with scrubbers, you potentially get uh, higher speeds due to the low fuel price, which increases the uh, emission significantly of NOx and CO2. And with an open loop scrubber, you're simply moving the, the ash and the, the heavy metals. Uh, you know, they end up in the water anyway, right? Uh, the, the sulfur is not necessarily bad because it reacts with the alkalinity of the seawater but it's a partly a meaningless process to scrub in the middle of, of the ocean and then pump it out in the ocean. So it feels like a very backwards uh, development and we really hope that a majority of owners do not go for it 
And just to add, right, that the people forget that it's much tougher to pass on uh, a sunken cost than it is to pass on the fuel price. So people believe that they will be the only ones, but, you know, as an operator, the, the shippers are smart, right? So if you've installed scrubbers on all your ships, you know, good luck uh, charging them uh, a price that's reflecting the, the low sulfur price. Uh, can't but agree with all the panelists. Uh, I would just add some statistics, I think, which has been really missing from this entire debate on scrubbers. If you look at the latest uh, statistics put up by Clarkson's, then as of the end of March, we had less than 0.3% out of 95,000 ships that need to fit scrubbers, having fitted scrubbers. If you look at the forward book and add those ships in, then the total population size becomes 97,500 ships, and of which only 0.45% would be fitted with scrubbers. At the Marine Money Conference in Hong Kong, uh, Univan uh, and their uh, amalgamation with uh, Anglo Eastern, uh, the, the CEO said, out of the 632 ships that I have, only 10 ships have been fitted with scrubbers. So really, if you were the refineries and you saw these type of statistics, would you even produce one ton of uh, dirty oil, one ton of high, uh, high sulfur fuel oil? So anybody who fits a scrubber, I think he is really going to have a very, very expensive fuel that he'll need to buy almost immediately once the deadline comes into play. Uh, last weekend, uh, I think it was reported in Tradesman that Exxon says clearly by the middle of next year, we will have as much uh, low sulfur fuel oil as you need in all the major, port, major bunkering ports in the world. So I, it's, it's a no-brainer. Just don't uh, do anything. Make it a level playing field. Let the customer pay. Thanks, Khaled. I think our research also shows about between 1% and 3% of the global fleet will probably have uh, scrubbers, so thereabouts. But I think our time is up, but before we end, I want to give the opportunity to somebody from the audience to ask a question, if they have any burning questions. Yes, we have a question over there. Uh, uh, good evening, sir. I'm from SOS, Singapore Organization of Cement. I, I have one quick question uh, for the panel uh, because recently I received a WhatsApp big message from uh, do, I don't know who they say in future uh, uh, shipping uh, trade uh, are no longer in demand because uh, Japan, uh, China, uh, elsewhere in the Far East they will uh, ship, ship their cargo by land, by uh, cross Asia, Asia Railway. Because they say using, using the railway, uh, go to Europe, take about six days. By using ship, passing Singapore, uh, Malacca Strait, Indian Ocean, uh, Red Sea, Mediterranean, uh, sorry, Suez, Mediterranean and English Canal take about three weeks. And then some more, they say uh, in future, maybe all uh, for China, we, they will ship through Pakistan when the port and the pipeline ready. Is it true or not? I don't know. Whether NATO, uh, for me, NATO is no, no accent, talk only. Whether NATO or true, I don't know. Maybe you can give your opinion. Thank you. I think there's already several railway lines which connect China with uh, Western Europe, uh, mainly moving the container cargoes. But perhaps who would, who would like to take that on, on the bulk uh, sector? Do you see potential of bulk moving on, on the rail lines? Rail freight at the cheapest cost is about seven times more expensive than shipping freight. So I think it's a no-brainer for bulk cargoes. You will never need rail freight for that. Rail freight, as Reginald has already explained, even for India, to move coal within India, the rail freight is so expensive that imports of coal will continue in India. So I don't see that uh, rail is ever going to compete with dry bulk in, uh, in terms of taking away demand. And the, the, the trains don't float. And you know most of the big dry cargo 
trade routes are, are cross oceans, right? The grain is moving from South America to, to Asia and from the US and from Australia, etc. So cannot be replaced by, by rail, uh, you know, technically. Okay, thanks. Any more questions or otherwise we can all go to drinks? Or okay, last chance. I guess if nobody else, then uh, it's thank you very much to the panel. As, uh, and, uh, thank you for a great uh, last panel. Absolutely uh, tremendous. Thank you very much. And ladies and gentlemen, uh, I will conclude uh, the uh, forum today. I have to confess I am uh, awed and overwhelmed and uh, delighted that uh, our first uh, maritime forum in Singapore, I, I, I can claim it was a success. Uh, thank you to everybody for uh, making it such a great event and we will see you next year. Thank you very much.